Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We welcome you to this Elder Justice Initiative webinar, a walk through the MDT Guide and Toolkit. As with all technology, uh, there may be a momentary lapse in the webinar today. In the event of a problem, please be patient and remain with us, and the webinar should resume shortly. Uh, we want to just take a moment to see that everyone's connected uh, and make sure that you're not having any technical or audio issues. If you are having any problems, please send us private chat message to the technical specialist Jason in the feedback box that's found on the lower right of your screen. I see that some of you are already utilizing that, so that's great. We'll be using that throughout the, the webinar today. Uh, if you cannot access the chat or you're having difficulties with the web portion, you can send Jason an email at jadams at ovctech.org. So throughout the webinar today, if you do have questions, we encourage you to use the chat feature and send us your questions. We'll be stopping to address pertinent questions at the end of each chapter as we review the toolkit. Um, and we'll also take some time at the end of the webinar to address any remaining questions that there are. Um, finally, we want to make a note that today's audio or today's session is being recorded. It will be available on the OVC TTAC training website. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to our first and only speaker today, Talitha Gwyn Shaver. Uh, she is the technical advisor for the MVP Technical Assistance Center. Talitha. Hi, thank you, Lori, and welcome, everyone. Um, today, we are going to be talking a little bit about the MDT Technical Assistance Center. We are a project of the Elder Justice Initiative. And then we're going to be spending the bulk of our time today doing a live demonstration and walkthrough of the MDT Guide and Toolkit. We'll talk about how to use the guide and highlight content from various chapters. And we'll do things a little differently in this webinar. We'll be taking questions as they come in, as they relate to the chapter that we are discussing. So we may hold questions later on. So if you submit a question and it isn't being answered right away, don't worry. We're probably trying to work it in um, to a, a, a forthcoming chapter that we'll be highlighting. Um, it, we will also address final questions at the end. But we would like this to be interactive, so if you have questions along the way, you are welcome to send them over. Let's start today with a poll question. Um, this question will be a live question that you can respond to on your screen, and it will give us a little bit of information about who is on the call today, and that will help me tailor the content that I highlight to best meet your needs. And it looks like we have lots of social workers here today, some project administrators, legal, medical, um, some victim services, high victim services. I'm so glad that you could all be here with us today. And thank you for responding, because this will help me focus our conversation to come. OK, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Elder Justice Initiative. Um, the mission is to support and coordinate the Department of Justice's enforcement and programmatic efforts to combat elder abuse, neglect, and financial fraud and scams that target older adults. And the initiative does this in a few ways, by promoting justice for older adults, helping older victims and their families, enhancing state and local efforts through training and resources, and supporting research to improve elder abuse policy and practice. On the website, you'll find a variety of content to support various professions in this field. We have information for victims, their families, and caregivers. We have information about financial exploitation, and information for prosecutors, law enforcement, and victim specialists. And now we have information about elder abuse multidisciplinary teams. So we're really excited about this new project, the MDT Technical Assistance Project. And um, our role is really to provide tools and resources and individualized consultations 
to help facilitate the growth and expansion of elder abuse case review teams across the country. And we do this by providing resources, such as today's guide and toolkit, which we'll be discussing further. But we also provide consultations. And I want people to know that all of our services are free of cost and available to anybody looking to start or grow an elder abuse case review MDT. And we can do consultations on the phone or email. We also do remote consultations via Skype. If you want to get your team together, we can do a Skype call. Um, and we really are looking to problem solve any issues you might have in starting your team or any barriers that you encounter through the development of your team. We also provide in-person consultations for communities that would like a more hands-on approach. And then we focus also on educational opportunities, such as this webinar. So we're going to go now to the live um, MDT guide and toolkit. And I am going to actually show you how to navigate there. So in your browser, you would just type in elderjustice.gov, and it auto-directs you to the Elder Justice website. On this left-hand side, navigation, you can see multidisciplinary teams listed below victim services and just above research. If you click on that, you'll go to our new MDT TAC page that talks about the work that we do, our mission, and has information about um, forthcoming products and services. We have an announcements category here as well. And that has lots of rich information that we keep up to date, so you might want to check back regularly to hear about our announcements. But here in the center, the heart of our project is our new MDT guide and toolkit. This is the landing page of the guide, and this is your table of contents. On the left-hand column, you will find the chapter, and a brief one-sentence explanation about what you will find in that chapter. In the left-hand column, you will find the toolkits that are associated with each chapter. So let's just start here with the How to Use This Guide chapter. And this will show you um, a little bit about how each chapter is laid out. The background of this guide, I think, is really relevant. We started with about 300 pages of research into MDTs, multidisciplinary teams. And that included sample documents from around the country, research, um, all sorts of um, really great resources that other people lent to us to see how they had developed their teams. We also dove deeply into the world of child abuse and domestic violence, because as you may know, um, the world of elder abuse has not had MDTs for as long as these other fields have. So we really looked across disciplines to pull together the best content to create this guide. This is a living document. So we intend for this document to grow every year with new resources, new information, new research. And you are a key component of this guide as well because we're taking feedback very seriously. And um, we're also reaching out to the community to get additional toolkit items. So as we go through the guides today, if you start thinking about a document or some policy that you have in place for your team that you think others might benefit from, you can send that information to me. And we'll review it to see if it meets our inclusion criteria. And we'll actually be adding content and possibly your content. If there is a void, if you think this is great information, but what I really need is X, Y, or Z, you can contact me with that as well. And we'll be looking to add in the content that the field is requesting. So it's a very um, two-way street living document. On the left-hand side, you'll see the menu. It has a drop-down menu here. And you can navigate from the chapters to any other chapter in the guide. Below that, you will see a list of toolkit items for the guide. And on the right-hand column, you'll see the guide content for um, each chapter. I just want to give you a little preview here 
Um, in the toolkit item for each chapter, you can download the chapter with citations. Citations are hard to view on the web, and so we made PDFs of each chapter so that as you're going through, if you want to know what research went into the chapter, you can easily open the PDF and review the end notes. Where there are um, resources available online, we do have links. But as you know, much research is um, copyrighted, and we're not able to put it online. So for the bulk of the citations, you just have the information about where to go to find the research that we are um, referencing. So let's go here to chapter one. And in chapter one, you will find lots of good information about what MDTs are, how we are defining MDTs. Um, and you'll also find good information about the benefits of MDTs and the types of problems that they can address in their community. I think this information is really vital because when putting together a team, one of the first things that people usually ask is, um, is this really valuable? Do we need another meeting? Who is this going to benefit? And so straight off in chapter one, we've got the benefits of this multidisciplinary team approach so that you can draw from this content for recruitment purposes and for um, swaying the opinion of people who you would like to have participate on your team. Let's go back up. And you'll see on the left hand side, we have a chapter summary for each chapter as well. Lori, do we have any questions that we should address at this point? Hi, Talita. There are uh, no questions at this point about Chapter 1. We're working with uh, several folks to correct their audio, but otherwise we are all good on questions. OK, sounds good. Let's go ahead and go to Chapter 2, Meeting the Needs of Your Community. And if you are having audio problems and you're concerned about missing something, this webinar is being recorded, and you can come back and listen in um, to anything that you may have missed. Um, chapter two is all about digging into the community that you are residing in and figuring out how best to meet your, the needs of your community. Every MDT will be a little bit different. And every MDT has to adapt to their environment and the needs of their community. So we talk a little bit about how to get in there and figure out what your focus should be. And one of my favorite pieces of the guidance toolkit is in this chapter, which is a needs assessment worksheet. So if you've never done um, a community needs assessment, if you've never conducted one, it can feel a little overwhelming, especially if you aren't from the world of research. If you're a social worker or an administrator, I know whenever I was um, an administrator in, at the San Francisco Elder Abuse Forensic Center, tackling a needs assessment felt really overwhelming. But it's something that I think adds a lot of value to your work. It will help you identify not only the problems that elders might need in your community, but resources that are already available that can help support your work, um, barriers that you might need to address, other teams that are doing similar work, you don't want to duplicate efforts. How do you bring people in? Um, special populations that might need your services. And this information will go directly to helping you figure out what your organizational structure should be, who should be invited, um, what your affiliation should be, what your purpose is going to be. So just quickly, I'm going to click on the needs assessment worksheet to give you an idea of what it has in it. Our goal with these worksheets and with all of the toolkit items is not to be prescriptive, not to say you have to do it this way. These are the questions you need to ask because we don't know your community the way you know it. Our goal is to answer questions about what goes into a community needs assessment and offer some samples. And then we have exercises that are prompts that will help you develop your own questions for the guide, I mean, for your um, needs assessment. So for each section, we have explanations about what should go into um, the development of a needs assessment. 
gives you some nice samples of what other people have been doing, even some example questions that you might want to consider, and then these little exercises and prompts. So you can go through this worksheet, and then hopefully at the end of it, if you've done all of the exercises, you too will have all of the content that you need to put together your own community needs assessment. Do we have any questions here? So we do have a question from Thomas Dean. It's not uh, specific to this chapter, but it is, a, I think, a good question. Uh, as a living document, when the document is updated, will you be sending out an email to announce those updates, or will it be up to the users to check back periodically for changes? Yes, we will be sending out email announcements. We will send announcements to the Elder Abuse Listserv, the National Elder Abuse Listserv. We will also send them to today's participants. And you can, you and anybody in your office can email me directly. My contact information will be at the end and say that you would like to be on our distribution list. And if you do that, you will get our little announcements that go out monthly. So you won't be overwhelmed with information from us. We try to keep our announcements to one or two a month. And another place where you can go to find out if we have anything new will be the announcements page of the MDT that we looked at earlier. Um, because every time we add something to the guide, the plan is to announce it on the MDT page. So you can navigate to the MDT page and go to Announcements, and then you can see anything that's new and happening here will be posted in, in the news. So you can see we have a few announcements here already, and you can also easily reference our past um, webinars from this page. So this is a good section to know about. Okay, and a follow-up question. Um, it might be served by the announcements page if there's an archive. But there, there, will there be a list of changes that um, remains on the website? A list of changes. I, we anticipate that the majority of the changes will be additions rather than subtractions. So we'll be adding toolkit items, and the previous toolkit items will stay in place. So what you'll see is the toolkit items section grow for each chapter. In fact, we have our second and third round editions already planned. Um, the first round will come out by the end of summer, and the second round will come out next year. If there is some reason why we feel that content is no longer relevant and needs to be deleted, then that can be added to our monthly blast, and we can let you know, look, we think that this is no longer a best practice, and here's what we would like to offer you instead. But we anticipate, at least for the first couple of rounds, that it will be additions, new things that you can find there that we will let you know about. Okay, great. And another question from Angela McBride. How do you find out what MDTs are already in existence? Is there a registry online? Oh, don't you wish that there were. One of the projects that we are working on to give you a little sneak peek is that we are partnering with USC to develop an MDT map. This is probably going to be six months to a year in the making. So um, just to let you know, we are thinking about the fact that it is difficult to tap into the MDT network and to know what teams exist. We do offer some suggestions in the um, needs assessment planner and worksheet. Um, in that planner, in that worksheet, you will see that we recommend not only assessing the needs of elders, but doing a survey of the resources and the teams are already in your area. So what you will need to do is identify the professions at the sort of a top level down that you would like to um, send a survey to so that they can give you the information that they know about. Um, so let's just take a quick look at the plan, at the needs assessment worksheet, because I think we have it up. So here is a suggestion that we have, identifying these various, the point people at these various agencies. These are suggestions. Your community may look different. You may have more or less um, agencies and organizations that you would like to contact. But pulling together these individuals so that you know who to draw information from is one of the first steps. Because 
whenever we conducted an MD, uh, our first MDT needs assessment survey in San Francisco, we found that we had some duplicative work going on. And um, we needed to collaborate with people who had similar MDTs. And there was a staff team that we ended up um, merging with. So you may identify similar teams that you might want to work with when you do that. And here's a, a good starting place for who you should be networking with to see what those resources are um, in your community. OK, anything else? That's all the questions we have at this time. All right, so let's go to Chapter 3, Selecting Team Members. Um, so who should be on your team? You have, we just talked about who you might want to be surveying or asking questions of in your needs assessment, who you should send the surveys to. Um, but who do you want to participate on your team? So this chapter goes into some common potential core members. And then it goes further to talk about who from those agencies has desirable characteristics to be collaborative and work on your team. That's a piece that I think a lot of teams overlook. Um, we also talk a lot about recruitment. The things that you need to pull together to effectively recruit um, high level, really good quality people to participate on your team, how to personalize those recruitment, and um, different strategies that you may want to take, including things that you might want to think about, including in a recruitment letter. We also suggest having a new member orientation meeting and really focusing on things about uh, learning how to be a team. Because just because you get people around the table doesn't necessarily mean you've got an MDT. Everybody has to learn how to work with one another and have a good understanding of what each person can contribute. In this chapter, we have a really nice toolkit item here, member roles and contributions. And I'll just click on this one quickly. This is a 16-page document. So the first couple of pages are sort of your usual suspects, right? People who are often on elder abuse multidisciplinary teams. You've got APS and law enforcement and prosecutors. Um, but then it gets down into some people that perhaps you hadn't thought about inviting, like mental health professionals, occupational therapists, um, system or community-based victim, victim witness advocates, um, forensic nurses, sexual assault advocates. There are a lot of people who you might want to invite to your team and you may want to decide whether you would like to have them as a standing core member or if you would like to develop relationships with these professionals so that you can consult with them on an as-needed as needed basis. So the first column is who they are. The second is um, a little bit about each profession. And the third column is what you might expect for them to be able to contribute to your team. Each one of these has some research associated with it about um, groups who had these representatives on their team and what they were able to bring to the table. And if you go to Chapter 3 Summary with Citations, you can read more about the research that went into this um, whole chapter. This chapter really lends itself well to going directly and to building a strong foundation um, before I go there, Lori, are there any other questions I should address? No, I'm not seeing any others at this time. OK. So once you get to this point in the guide, you have thought about what kind of a team you want to be. You've done a community needs assessment. You've surveyed um, the other professionals in your community, as well as try to get a better understanding of the needs of the elders in your community. And you've decided who you would like to recruit. You've pulled together a team. Now that you've got everybody together, what should you be doing? Well, one of the first things you need to do is make sure you're all on the same page. Um, work together on developing your mission and your vision. Um, you also want to think strategically about how your team is going to grow and work through your policies together. 
what are all of the details going to look like. You want to have a strong foundation so that each member has a good understanding of what they can expect to get out of the NDT and what they should be contributing to the NDT. So working through these details is very important. You also want to plan for ongoing maintenance, maybe building in a business meeting, talking about funding streams and in an ongoing manner, um, working on developing trust between your team members in an ongoing manner. How is your team going to resolve conflict? Um, what can you um, expect your time commitments to be? So thinking about some of these pieces in an ongoing manner is going to be really important. And in the toolkit item, we have several samples. I think there are three teams that have very generously provided their protocols. So you can see how these other teams have worked through these various issues as well. Lori, are there any questions? Yes, we have one question from Wendy Hillman. Um, how do you get around the whole privacy issues when you're inviting various disciplines to the MDT? Hmm. That's a great and timely question because Chapter 5 is ethical and legal considerations. Um, it is challenging. It can be challenging to work through information sharing, confidentiality issues, but there are a lot of teams who are doing it well. And so Chapter 5, Ethical and Legal Considerations, we have lots of samples in this chapter. So you can see the MOUs that have been developed for various teams and also the confidentiality forms and policies that other teams put into place. A great place to start is here with your statutory review. So most states say something about what is allowed to be shared among team members um, that are working together on elder abuse cases. And so we actually did a statutory review. And for each state, we have it broken into categories um, so that you can easily go to your state, stat state statute and see what it says, whether it's explicit that you can share information for uh, the purpose of working together on an elder abuse case, whether it stays silent on it, whether it says it's permissible um, or not. So you want to start with your statute so you can have a good understanding of what um, you can legally expect to be able to do within your team. One limitation of having statutes is that statutes can be interpreted differently um, in various counties. So you're going to want to have some consensus. When you pull your team together and you're working through those foundational policy-oriented um, questions, you want to look at your statutes and get some good recommendations from your prosecutor's office and other professionals to see, do you all agree on the interpretation of your statutes? So start there. Then I would say the next step is to have a strong MOU so that you understand what each agency is going to contribute to your team, and having strong confidentiality forms and policies. So your policy can go beyond having a confidentiality form into how do you protect client information. Some teams opt to have redacted team meetings where they do not use names. Some teams use names, but then they shred meeting materials after the meeting. And these are all protocols that you will need to discuss with your team to see what works best for you. We are working um, on a project, a special confidentiality best practices project that we hope to have out um, by the beginning of next year. Because this is such a huge issue, and as we do consultations with teams around the country, I would say that um, this is probably the number one or number two question that we get. How do we talk to each other effectively and um, legally? How do we share information? So I would start with this chapter reading about linkage agreements, confidentiality policies, looking at the samples, and delving into your statute. And then there will be more to come in terms of recommendations regarding best practices. Any other questions, Lori? No further questions. 
Okay. Yeah, I know that that the ethical and legal piece is a a big complicated component of putting together an MVP and one that's really essential and vital because I have participated on teams where um, the groundwork really hadn't been done to establish strong protocol. And so you have people who are on different pages and people who are holding back and who wouldn't collaborate. And that's toxic to teams. You have to all agree on what information you can share and how you're going to share it so that you can effectively work together for better outcomes for victims because that's why you're all there. Um, an often overlooked but really essential component of having a strong MDT is the MDT coordinator. There's a lot that goes into um, coordinating MDTs effectively. So we have an entire chapter devoted to the MDT coordinator. Um, we have information about anybody, for anybody who is functioning as or serving as a coordinator and for those who are looking to add a coordinator, the type of person you might like to hire for the job, as well as what their duties really are, their responsibilities. You can see it's pretty extensive. Um, in my past, I also served as an MDT coordinator, and I can tell you it's a lot of work, and that person is really the glue that holds the team together. They have to be good at building relationships and at um, navigating challenging situations so, and big personalities. A lot of times when you have um, really high-level MDTs that are really functioning well and have great leadership from multiple organizations, you're going to have multiple perspectives about how things should be done and what the priorities should be and um, people who are you know, at the top of their field. And so you really have to have somebody who can um, equalize participation, can keep an eye on time, who can um, really hold the stakes in a neutral way and facilitate the team meetings in, in a productive manner. And it's, it's no small thing to find somebody who has all of those attributes and can handle all of the many multifaceted responsibilities that come with coordinating a team. A lot of teams have a person who serves as a coordinator in the beginning, but they may not have the funding for a full-time position or even a half-time position of just one person. So um, this is really designed to help you think about um, getting an MDT coordinator on your team and what you could expect from them. Professional development is also a key component of having a high-functioning MDT. Um, there are three types of professional development that we talk about in the guide. Professional training, so within your own wheelhouse, getting deeper and um, more relevant information and training in your field. MDT training, so learning how to work together as a team. And then cross-training. Cross-training is really key, in my opinion. When you sit down with teams that come, with individuals that come from these very professionals, you begin to try on the lens through which they see this work, and it is invaluable. So you want to learn from all of the people who are at the table what their professional limitations are, what their professional perspective is, what they can contribute, um, how they work their cases in their world, and, um, and then how you can work best with them. This cross-training piece is really key and should be built into the meetings, um, in my opinion. So we focus a lot on cross-training, and we're also putting together cross-training webinars where we can kind of help um, each individual profession learn about the other team members work. Um, and whenever this is working well on teams, one of the things I have seen is that it really transforms the way everybody at the table does their job in a really positive way. Because all of a sudden, you have social workers who are understanding um, 
what law enforcement sees whenever they are viewing the same situation as a crime scene. And you have law enforcement who are understanding the social worker's values and what the social worker is looking for when they go in the home and uh, what their limitations are within their profession. And um, I've heard it, the term used, the forensic effect, where you start looking more holistically at your cases from the professional view of those that you're working with. And it really augments and enhances uh, the work that you do. So we have lots of great information in here about starting your own cross training. And um, Lori, are there any questions at this point? Yes, we have questions. We're on a roll here. Um, so one of the, uh, a couple of questions I'm going to save to Lynn because they're more general and we will provide information around who to contact um, and some other information like that. But more specific to this chapter, have you seen, this question comes from Samantha McGovern, have you seen successful MDTs that don't have a coordinator? Yes, we have. It's a lot of work and you have to have good relationships with and buy-in from the other agencies at the table. So if you're not going to have one person coordinate, you might want to think about having a rotating chair or having, um, having a representative that always takes on certain components. So you could have an individual who says, I will always send out the meeting announcements. Another person who says that they will be responsible for, for tracking your case outcomes. Somebody else who takes responsibility for setting up the meeting and making sure documents are shredded at the end. So you can divide and conquer. It just requires a lot of coordination and buy-in and the willingness of your partner agencies to pitch in and to make it work. All right, great, thank you. Uh, and another question from Tony, forgive me if I butcher your name, Bonsera, Bonsera. In, in areas where MBTs have been created, who or what has been the catalyst? What's generally uh, fueling this, this creation of the MBT? Is it coming from uh, county attorneys or legislation? What's going on? I can tell you that it varies um, from team to team. The thing that they all have in common is that there is a champion. There's somebody who is willing to advocate for this, to do the legwork, and to pull the appropriate individuals together to move the project forward. So we have seen it come from various disciplines. We've had teams that are really great and high-functioning, wonderful teams that have come from prosecutors' offices. We see them from APS. We see a lot of teams that um, were started of social workers, either in the community or within uh, social services. Um, but we've also seen teams that were started from law enforcement, so and those that are run out of hospitals or universities. So when you think about your affiliation up in the beginning, I think it's in chapter one, when you're talking about defining what type of team you're going to be in your affiliation, that really has to do with where your team is going to live. The affiliation means is this going to be a hospital-run MDT? Is this going to be housed within a university? Is it going to be housed within a social services agency or a Department of Aging? Um, and that can vary. What you really need is somebody who cares deeply about this issue and is willing to grease the wheel, to put their shoulder to the, to the grindstone to do the work. Okay, and you were talking a little bit about where the MDT originates. And uh, a related question from Arlene Markarian. Have there been any problems with the prosecutor or DA's office hiring the coordinator? Hiring a coordinator. Um, I'm sure there have been because there are, there's problems. You can run into innumerable problems um, as you start to grow a team of this size. Um, I don't know of any offhand who's had difficulty. I can. I think what she's getting at is with their hiring requirements and making a person maybe an employee of the prosecutor's office, how does that work? Um, and that would be something that each prosecutor's office would have to work out themselves. But what I have seen work well is having that coordinator position called out in an MOU. So in San Francisco, for example, 
the prosecutor's office was the lead agency in getting the um, MDT started. Uh, the Elder Abuse Forensic Center, there were, were multiple MDTs, so I'm um, speaking specifically about the Forensic Center. So the um, district attorney really pushed for us to get our initial funding and pull everybody together. Then they signed MOUs with various organizations. One of the MOUs they signed was with a social services um, organization and nonprofit. And the nonprofit contributed the coordinator. So you don't the coordinator, even though the idea came from the DA's office and the push came from the DA's office, the coordinator was sitting within the nonprofit. So you could have the coordinator sitting in any of the offices um, as long as you have a strong MOU and then you have a policy about hiring and firing and who's going to handle that and under what conditions. So it's really about having that strong um, memorandum of understanding between agencies. Great. Thanks, Talitha. Uh, have you Alrighty. seen uh, and another question um, kind of related to the development and, and creation of MDT from Kristen? Mm, I'm not going to be able to ask that probably. Lace, um, have you seen MDT being implemented statewide as a matter of state APS policy? A statewide MDT. I have seen statewide tax forces. I have not seen statewide elder abuse case review MDTs. We've seen MDTs and um, CRCs and uh, task forces that were working on state, um, working at the state level on systems issues. But in terms of case review, those are usually um, local because they're going to involve local law enforcement, local prosecutors, local social services. We have seen teams that are uh, pulled together um, across counties. So where you'll have multiple counties working together, particularly in rural areas where there are not a lot of services to go around, where maybe you only have one or two APS workers, um, for law enforcement or medical professionals with elder abuse expertise are rare so that you can share those professional expertise and come together for meetings. I haven't seen it at the statewide, but I have seen it in, with multiple counties. Okay. And, and Kristen later clarified here that she's more interested in hearing about requirements by the state for local regions to have MDTs. So if you want to know what your MDTs can and can't do, I would start with the statutory review that's in Chapter 5. Um, it goes into not just information sharing, but it's actually about multidisciplinary teams. So you can kind of dive into that as a place to start about what your state says about MDTs. OK, great. Uh, and two final questions here, and then we'll, we'll let you move on. And if you do have sure. questions, continue to send them in uh, for, for the audience. Um, so one is, how do you suggest addressing the fact that you might have multiple competing MDTs? Um, I, multiple competing MDTs. I think that it would be really important if you identify that you've got two or three MDTs um, to first of all see, do there really need to be multiple MDTs? Um, so sometimes we'll see specialty uh, teams that are broken out. So you might have a team that only looks at financial abuse or one that does elder death reviews, um, one that does hoarding and cluttering um, cat, like a task force. So you can potentially see that there is um, a need for these multiple teams. But if you've got a multidisciplinary case review team through APS and one through the DA's office and one through a social services agency, I would think that the first thing to do would be to reach out and build those relationships with um, whoever is re the representative or coordinator for those various teams and see if you can merge into one team, if for nothing else, for efficiency's sake. You don't want, there, there are not a lot of elder abuse resources out there. <laughs> And so it's better to share them equitably if possible and to have the best professionals um, come together in, in a single team, if, if at all possible. Now, um, I have seen one thing that has seen work really well is you might have a, a, an overall elder abuse case review meeting and then have um, 
they, the elder death review team, but then have a representative from the elder death review team sit in on your meeting so that you have some communication back and forth between. Mute off. Um, you don't want to have one case being worked by multiple agencies and there be this wall where nobody sees what's happening. That's counterproductive to the entire idea of a multidisciplinary team. The goal is to get everybody together to bring their professional expertise to better serve these clients and to get everybody in the room talking to each other um, in a more efficient way. Okay, I think you, you partially were getting at the other, the other question from Dina, which is, um, do you recommend that we have multiple MDGs if we serve multiple jurisdictions? Um, it, that's a tricky, uh, even trickier question because that really depends on your community. So if all of those jurisdictions um, are really robust and they have their own law enforcement prosecutors, social services, um, then it can be really helpful to have and have individualized teams for each of those jurisdictions because then you're not listening to cases that you can't collaborate on. So if you've got law enforcement there talking about cases or prosecutors talking about cases that have enough, they're outside of their domain, they, they don't have jurisdiction over it, then they're just sitting there for no reason and then there might be more of a confidentiality issue that would come up because why are they hearing cases that they can't work on? So the goal is to hear cases that you can work on. Now, for counties that don't are not resource rich, you don't. If you're sharing um, law enforcement, if you're sharing medical expertise, if you're sharing a psychologist, um, then it makes sense to come together to uh, to work together on those cases across counties. Okay, great. All right, we'll let you move on at this point. Keep the questions coming. Okay, so let's delve into case review in Chapter 8 because this is really the heart of the MDT. So in this chapter, we go into the characteristics of a case review. We have lots of sample forms in your toolkit, sample referral forms and sample case report forms, which are different. The referral form is your intake. What is the current presenting problem? Who are you serving? And then the case report forms are um, more active, what is being done on these cases, who's collaborating, what is the case plan. So we have lots of great information in here about how to put your, your meetings together, um, who to have at the table to, to talk about cases, how to build trust among your MDT, the ever important snacks <laughs> or, or meeting logistics, how to bring people together, and um, also a, a few comments here about having some meeting ground rules so that people know what to expect from attending meetings. And then we have a flow chart here who show, that shows how a, case re, how a case might flow through um, your MDT, which I think is really useful. So, um, this section, I think, is really resource-rich in the toolkit area in particular. Let's go ahead now and go to Chapter 9, another really rich chapter, Anticipating Challenges and Troubleshooting. So every team is going to have challenges. There is no end, really, to the number of barriers one might encounter while trying to put together an MDT. And um, this chapter has some really great information about common threats to collaboration and ways that you might overcome those common barriers. Um, every time I look at this chapter, I'm reminded of a thing that my dad used to say. He used to tell me, you're going to make mistakes, just make your own. And so we kind of approach this chapter with that mindset. That here are the well-known and documented problems and the ways that other people have worked through them. So perhaps you can avoid some of these um, challenges and find your own. Um, but it is very thorough in talking about the various barriers that you might encounter and really great information here about ways that teams have worked through them. 
And this is one of the chapters that you might really want to take a look at the citation um, because it's very well documented. Um, here, let's see. We've got, we've got lots of research about barriers. <laughs> so if you see something that looks particularly interesting and you want to explore it further, we've got lots of rich information here for you. Um, chapter 10 is case tracking and program evaluation. And I'm excited about this chapter for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that this can be a challenging area for teams, but it's essential. You've got to learn how to track what it is that you're doing for multiple reasons. For funding, you're going to have to justify your existence moving forward if you've got any sort of public or grant funding. Um, and we have really good examples here about how to manage your data and how to think about it from the beginning so that you're not coming back a couple of years down the line and thinking, wait, how do we capture what it is that we're doing? There's even a sample logic model so that you can build in your outcomes, your inputs, outputs, and outcomes directly from the beginning of the development of your team. And for those of us who don't have a research background, this can be new language and new learning and a new way of thinking about service delivery. So I think it's really valuable. The other reason I'm really excited is because we work with USC, and they actually contributed a toolkit item, which is a free sample um, case tracking database. So it's an Excel database. You can click on this form, your sample intake database, toolkit, then scroll down here to where to download, and you can just go and download the, the Microsoft Access file, and it has a password, it's password protected, you'll need to change that when you download it. You can also download one that has a sample case in it, so you can see what that looks like, and it comes with a corresponding referral form, which can be uploaded to your database. So if you were to distribute the referral form Say, let's just say, for an example, APS was going to be your main, um, the main organization that you were going to intake cases from. They could have their referral form on their computer, fill it out, send it to you, and you can upload it into your database. So if you want a place to start and you don't have the, um, the professional relationship with somebody who could build one for you for free, or you don't have funding to delve into database development right now, you could at least start with a functioning um, elder abuse case tracking database. And this will also grow. One of the projects we're hoping to see grow over time, but right now it's available um, with your intake and referral form information. Do we have any questions that I should address while we're still here in this view of the guide? It's not on this particular view. There's some general questions okay. at the end. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. So Lisa, there are some actually some questions coming now about the link to the USC um, indicating that they're not working. Um, you know, I had one other person tell me that, and they work for me. So let me see. Um, if, let me share my screen and go back to that. Can I share my screen again? There we go. I'm going to share my then, desktop. Mm -hmm. So on this, if you down, if you go to this form, you should just be able to click in on it, click on the link directly, and what it does is it starts automatically downloading it for you. So if you're right clicking and you're trying to say, oh, I'm a liar, it didn't work. Let's see. Let me refresh this. So go to the USB. 
okay, well, I will contact USC and see what's going on with their link because it was working as of yesterday. And we did a nice little run through. In the interim, if you want, I have the um, I have the document, the spreadsheet or the referral form and the access file on my computer. So if you're looking to download these right away, shoot me your email address and I will send them as attachments as a workaround. Okay. In a few minutes we'll be sharing contact information for Talisa uh, and also for the Elder Justice Initiative in general so for so that folks have follow up um, contact points. Sounds good. So we have a few more poll questions that we would like to wrap up with if you if you don't mind um, helping us dig in a little bit. We can start with poll question two. Um, what is the greatest barrier you've encountered while starting or running an elder abuse case review MDT? Um, this will help us think about how to focus the guide as we continue to grow it. Engaging team members is one of the biggest ones. Um, we're going to have a webinar coming out specifically on recruiting and maintaining um, team members. So that's good information to have. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move now to poll question number three. And we would like to know how you plan to use the MDT guide and toolkit. Are you looking to start an MDT? Are you looking to help one grow? Are you just going to share this with your colleagues? Um, are you looking to problem solve issues within your local MDT? Or maybe you don't plan to use the guide or toolkit at all. Thank you. And then let's think about our next question here. Um, what toolkit items we should create next for you? So you might want to get team building information, information about confidentiality and information sharing, rural resources, cross-training. So lots of cross-training needs, and that's good to know. We do have some cross-training webinars that are going to be coming out. We are also planning to work on a rural elder abuse conference. And if you have, if you work within a rural community and would like to be involved with us in developing more rural resources and, and knowing better what it is that you need in your community, let us know for sure. And then let's move on to, chat, to poll five. This is our last poll, so thank you for um, bearing with this. Um, what subject would you like our next webinar to be about? Lots of rural issues. You might want to think about team building, prosecutors, geropsychs, having neuropsychologists on your team, ethical and legal. Okay, great. I really appreciate your contributions through these poll questions because it, it it's taken very seriously. We really focus in on the needs of people who are participate, participating on our webinars and, and focus our work based on your responses. So I appreciate it. Are there any last questions that I should answer before we close today? Just one quick question from Claudette who came in earlier. Do you have materials in different languages? Mm, not for the guide at this time. On the website, we have a lot of um, the website content is in Spanish. We have elder abuse brochures in multiple languages. But the, currently, the guide and toolkit is only available in English. Okay, and one final question, who can I contact? So that takes us to the next slide. Yeah, so you can contact me anytime. 
Um, if you would like a consultation, if you'd like to collaborate, if you've got a question, you can email me or call me. I know that email address is incredibly long. I'm sorry. Um, I have a very long name, but please feel free to drop me a line. I usually get back to people within 24 hours, and I, I'm happy to field any questions that you might have on this subject. If you have more general questions or suggestions about the Elder Justice Initiative, you can contact the Elder Justice Initiative at elder.justice at usdoj.gov. And I think that wraps it up for us today, unless there are anything else that you'd like me to address, Lori. No further questions here. We have some emails for follow-up, so we'll make sure you get those. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your um, being here with us today.